are you? Welcome to LSB Feasters Radio Channel, where we keep great radio from the past alive. Today, we're going to New York in 1982 with 102.7 WNEWFM. Now, it was one of New York's rock stations, but it did something very special on this broadcast. It paid tribute to 77 WABC just days after WABC dropped its music radio format and flipped to all talk. May 10th, 1982. That was the day the music died. And that was when Music Radio 77 dropped that popular music format after all those years to move towards the future as a talk station. Uh, WNEW did a two-hour tribute, and it featured many WABC personalities, including Cousin Brucie, Bob Lewis, Herb Oscar Anderson, Chuck Leonard, and WNEW's own Scott Muni, who was program director. You'll hear longtime WABC program director Rick Sklar with some behind-the-scenes insight into the station. And it's a touching tribute for one radio station to basically honor another radio station. Uh, if you like it, feel free to give it a thumbs up and feel free to subscribe to the channel too if you like. All right, here it is, part two of WNEW's tribute to Music Radio 77 WABC. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Cousin. <laughs> Makes me laugh when I do this. Yee! This is your cousin, Brucey. Hi, everybody. Listen, I hope everybody's feeling terrific. I had a great time last week at Palisades Amusement Park. This Saturday, it's going to be Chubby Checker, Fats Domino, Tony Bennett. You know who he is, kids? <laughs> Tony? Tony Bennett will be there, too. And it's going to be a terrific thing. Right now, let's get right to our music. This goes out to Johnny and Paul, Sally and Susie, and Jimmy and Suzanne. Going steady for four months. Going steady for four months. Isn't that fantastic? Here's Chuck Berry on the Brucey Ferry Maybelline. <laughs> Maybelline. You turn the radio on and you know, hey, there's a guy there that can help you out, tell you about the traffic, and he, he, you trust him. It's credible. It's mm -hmm. not a music machine with this record, 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 and radio. You know, we don't do that. I, I can't. I don't know. How, I don't know how to do that kind of radio. I have to know what people want to wear in the morning. I want to tell them what to wear. I want them to know that I have an itch. I sneeze. I never use a cough box to this day. I sneeze. I'm a human being. You know, and people get a kick out of that. I, For sure. I don't want them to think I'm a magic being up in uh, uh, Mount Radio or something. I'm a friend. Cousin Bruce is their friend. And this is how I've survived all these years. And this is what I think radio has to offer. I'll give you a Cousin Bruce prediction. Okay. Within 50 years, babies will be born with a little black box on the right side of their head that says made in Taiwan, eight transistors. <laughs> My point is, radio is not a luxury. Radio is a necessity. It's part of life. It's day to day. It's, it's real. It's alive. And that's what I fight to keep radio. Uh, I'm very sad about WABC because, you know, let's face it, it's an end of an era. Did you hear the last few days and the last... I'll tell uh, you, I thought for the last few months anyway, I guess when the disc jockeys and the announcers realized that the change was going to come down, I tell you, that station sounded great for the last few months. They well, were playing music you hadn't heard. They everybody was touch in years. And, but and Dan, Dan I, I, you know, knowing Dan, I, Dan was a little sad. I, I know and Ron yeah. was sad, and everybody was counting the days. It was a count. And also, we emotionalized when we listened to it. I mean, let's face it, my life was in that. That was the greatest time of my life. How long were you there? Thirteen and a half years, about oh, thirteen and a half yeah. years. And uh, we had one heck of a party when I went off the air. That <laughs> it was really terrific. So I'm, I'm very sad today. I'm, I'm angry, as most of you know. You've been reading the press and watching television. I'm I've uh, taken a very interesting stand, which I don't want to get into here because I, I know there's a memory bank that we're doing here. And uh, I'm just disappointed uh, that this kind of radio has been poo-pooed by the so-called great executives. Uh, the great executives radio. are saying that music on AM radio is over its dead. Which, well, that, see, now you hit a very bad bone because that's the thing that got me crazy. And that's the thing that brought all the TV crews down to see Cousin Brucey. Uh, if they would have left that alone, I would have <laughs> I would have been angry and uh, sad, but not upset. Uh, they've upset me. AM radio today, uh, the quality of AM radio when it leaves my radio station is excellent. Uh, we do not have stereo right now, as you know. There's a big thing going on with stereo right now. I think we're down to 18 systems or something. So we're all waiting to see what happens. But you know, stereo is very nice, and you have a you have a magnificent station. WNEW FM is a you know it's it's a legend. There's no doubt about it. Scotty's done a great job, and all you guys are. But it's not. That your stereo. It's not that you're as clean as heck uh, with you with your the quality of the sound. It's that you gave the people a good bowl of cereal to listen to. <laughs> huh? 
Cracker Jacks are great. You don't have to give a person a prize in a box. I always said I love Cracker Jacks. I'd buy without the prize. Who needs the prize? So my point is, if you give people good radio, if you give good radio, you probably yeah, find it. Right. Like that little joke. Uh, they're going to listen. Was there any point in time where you were there where you started thinking, you know, this, why has, this is going to end? Yes. Yeah. Dan and I both knew this. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Scotty knew it, too, before he left there. He left a little early because we were still doing very well when Scott left. Uh... I started seeing this thing happening in the 70s. Uh, it's like watching an old aunt get sick and leaving her in the chair and not giving her any medicine. Uh, that's what happened. They started bringing guys in from California and guys mm -hmm. in from Dallas, and they started with these geniuses that live in Dallas and with the computers. Mm -hmm. You can't do that in New York. New York City is a living life. It's, it's an organ. You know, It's a huge, volatile, dynamic, living thing. And you just can't go to a computer readout and the thing says, boop, 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 play this, play this. You know, you can't do that. Hey, when I'm on the air, I know if the Lincoln Tunnel's crowded. I know if that guy in the toll booth has a stomachache. I knew when Mayor Koch had a headache. And I used to talk to him on the air. I knew who was missing. I helped the police. I knew if, uh, the, if a toothpaste uh, tasted good, I'd tell people. You know, that's what radio is. It's alive and dynamic. And, and they, they, they just didn't understand this. So over the, the, the last decade, the 70s, they let this slip. They got too darn involved in being number one, worried about being number one. Instead of watching their own backyard and doing the best creative radio they can do, maintaining what they were doing, reestablishing WABC as a, a live, people, one-to-one -one type medium, they let it go. They were too worried about FM coming in. Sure, FM was coming in. But why does everybody have to be number one? Why can't you do the best you can do and be creative? See, once you get a Afraid, you cannot be creative. You get you get fear. You're finished. You're finished. You're done. And that's it. It, 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 it uh, degenerated. It was not a natural thing. It, it could have been helped. I think cr a lot of creativity lies in uh, the opportunity to make a mistake. Yes. <laughs> you, you, Boy, you know, I'll tell you. I, sometimes I go on the air and I'll do things where I'll make a mistake. I'll make the wrong judgment. And I say to myself, Oh my God, Rick Slar is going to call me any minute. And I say, Wait a minute. I own this. I'm the boss. <laughs> Why not make mistakes? We used to make so many mistakes. You know, that's what made us so human. That's what made the success of that radio station. But I can tell you stories. There was one day when Bruce Marl came into the studio and I was doing the weather forecast. Dan Ingram. And we have what has since been called the brief showers incident. And it sounded like this. Brief shower, thunder shower this evening. I love brief showers. They're fun. Them briefs coming down. Cloudy with fuck. <laughs> Let me see those. At least they're talking to Brad. This is uh, our <laughs> cousin Bruce Marl wears Jackie classic briefs. He just, he just threw a dozen of them at me. <laughs> Hi. Uh, where were we? <laughs> yeah, I said, why don't we see what people would think with you and Jackie Shorts there and all that. I don't know. I was, they may have been another brand. I don't know. But then, they smell new. Uh, cloudy with fog tonight. Temperatures in the mid 70s. Pretty cloudy, warm, and humid Saturday. Your image is gone, Bruce. They know what you really are. Showers likely towards the evening tomorrow. Temperatures in the 80s. Cloudy with a chance of rain Saturday night and Sunday. I surrender. I surrender. I think one of the, the greatest, well, it was maybe a blooper, a, a desert, to show you the power of that radio station. Rick Slar and I were walking one day, we had uh, lunch, and uh, this is the, the beginning of the kite craze in, in the United States. Everybody was flying kites. You remember mm -hmm. that? Uh, about uh, late 60s or early mm -hmm. 70s. Something. And we decided to have a uh, WABC kite flying contest in Central Park. So we I called the mayor, who's a good friend of mine, and he said, sure, whatever you want, Bruce, you just be out of there by noon or something, you know, that type of thing, and keep it clean. So we gave $100 for the biggest kite, $100 for the smallest kite, $100 for the most unique kite. You know, that's what we used mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. The biggest kite, by the way, this is a great story, which I never believed to this day, and Sklar and I looked at it, we got a story, <laughs> it was a replica, a actual scale replica of the uh, flight of the Kitty Hawk, or the, uh, what's, what's it called, the, uh, Wright brother, Brothers. the Wright Brothers airplane. They built the kite, and some man was flying it. Well, anyway, here's the bit. To show you the power of this radio station and a blooper, we did not realize what we were going to cause. Uh, Rick and I got down there at 9 o'clock in the morning. The judging was supposed to start for four prizes. It was to start at 11 o'clock or something. The sky was literally so full. It's not just a story. It's so full of kites, we couldn't see the sky. He and I looked at each other, and we sort of shook our heads and said we were in severe trouble. And we, we made an announcement quickly, and we left. We got a lot of trouble with that one. There's a blooper. Not realizing that yeah, the, 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 power. The, the, the fierce mm -hmm. power of a radio station like WABC. Mm -hmm. Why should this happen? Why? Because people enjoyed it. What's happening over there? It's not 77. <laughs> <laughs> uh, come on. 
honey. Oh, come on already here. Terry, Terry, Terry. Oh, there's now stop it, Phyllis. Uh, You're listening to a salute to Music Radio WABC with love from NEWFM. WABC serving New York and America with music in tempo with today. On the radio 77, WABC, the Springer in New York Town, the only station with young ideas for New York. We were the hot shots in town, and uh, we were active, and I always got around. So uh, certainly the phenomena we knew about, and the very first arrival in our area of the Beatles was uh, out at the airport. And I went out to cover their arrival. Now, you know, the concert was not on yet or anything, but they, they had flown in, and they hustled them through a corridor, and into a room where they were going to meet the press. But in coming through the corridor, the uh, teeny bopper girls broke loose from a theater-type roping, red roping, knocked that over. And I was in the crowd coming from the plane with them, and so I was mauled. I mean, it was ridiculous. Uh, I had a beautiful overcoat on. It was cold. It got ripped right off, got ripped to shreds. And uh, it was pandemonium, but it was that way everywhere they went. Uh, They're... Their thing was the first idol type affair that uh, the American teenagers had had in a long time. You know, prior to that, there was always a guy coming along, and there was an Elvis, and there was a Frankie Avalon, there was a Fabian. Nothing quite like this in a group, and each girl's focusing on whichever one they really were into, or all of them as such. And, of course, they had the haircuts that the American boys didn't have. So, wow, all this going for them. From there, back to the hotel and um, in the limos and the screaming and the yelling and uh, and the panic when they went in the hotel on Park Avenue, one female type grabbed Ringo's uh, St. Christopher medal from his neck, ripped it off, and ran down the street with it. And uh, the next day, well, we talked about it on the air, and the next day she showed up and she had the St. Christopher's medal that his grandmother had given him. And it wasn't the value of the the uh, metal so much as the you know family heirloom type so she showed up and she had it and uh, Ringo thanked her and she got tickets to the concert and an autographed album and so forth and uh, I must say this the disappointing thing about the Beatles after all the hoopla and they finally got here alone as they were trapped and imprisoned in their hotel rooms not being able to walk down the street not being able to do anything was their pale white complexions I mean, each one of them looked to me as if they had been in a hospital. And I guess this this whole urgency of what happened and how they just blew up into these fantastic stars, they were tired and they were pale. And to see them later, as each year went on, and to follow them and see how much better they looked, it was really incredible. One other thing about the Beatles and the stay in the hotel. People don't think about that, but when you're in a hotel might be like a hospital, only it's a lot more comfortable, and everything's brought to your room. A person who has wanderlust isn't going to stay in that hotel. And Mr. Lennon was the wanderlust, because John left that hotel dressed as an old lady, and he went out on the town as an old lady with a cane and a wig and the makeup and the whole thing. John snuck around a little. I think Paul may have gotten out, too. The rest of them were afraid to do anything. It was amazing because we were in this hotel, Park Avenue, literally for about two or three blocks, was wall-to-wall young females, and some males too, Um, and they were all listening to the station. We were in a room adjacent to the floor where the Beatles were on, and we had our setup in the room, and we had our microphones in there, of course, and so 
I just opened the window once, and I said, uh, you know, any window that opened, my God. I mean, the crowd went bananas berserk, thinking it might be one of the Beatles or something. So I held the microphone down there and asked him, and I said, okay, can you hear us? Here? Okay, now we want... We we uh, we even had them sing Happy Birthday to the president at the time, and they did that because it was his birthday that day, and uh, and we had them do just everything. They were doing jingles, they were singing "I Love You," yeah, yeah. Anything you asked them to do, they did it. They were tuned in. Everybody didn't have a radio, but enough people did so that it was a solid sound at the station, and it was frightening. It really was frightening. such a great mood while that crowd is in such a great mood big dan out yeah. there on park avenue well, we dearly love them yeah Cato's here with cousin brucey and dan you're right there let's have a little sing along with all the crowd out there everybody yeah. stand by we want you to sing along to a few of our all-american jingles let's live it up all right can i sing along with the one about the team first we let's are ready the team everybody stand by and listen and sing along to our team jingle all right here we go sing along across the street. How convenient of them to decide to stay there. We went over there two days before they brought the Beatles into America for the first time and wired up the hotel with our RF equipment so you could walk from room to room and floor to floor with a microphone with a built-in transmitter in it. Once again, Rick Sklar. We also took the precaution of giving some bottles of scotch to the detectives who were going to be assigned to guard them so we could still get into their rooms. I remember one funny thing at the at the Warwick, because uh, you couldn't get within a mile of the place. The police had it all literally, you know, blocked off. You couldn't get into the hotel unless you were a guest. And there was one teenager, there were 20,000 surrounding the hotel, but one got in. Her father was staying at the hotel. So she talked him into letting her stay with him. And I remember we had gotten Paul McCartney out of the Beatles suite. And we were actually going to take him to the ABC suite, which was a floor above. And we, uh, I rang the, we were nervous being out in the hotel corridor, rang for the elevator. They still had elevator operators in those days. So I rang the up and down elevator, figuring we better get him into the first elevator that comes because it would be madness. And as luck would have it, the first elevator was going down and we're going up. But they stopped and a lady operating the elevator opened the door. And uh, there in the elevator was a businessman, this businessman with his teenage daughter who had talked dad into <laughs> letting her stay in the hotel with him just in the hopes of seeing the Beatles. And she was unfortunately looking down at the floor at that instant, and I started to talk to the elevator operator, and I said, would you please, I know this elevator is going down, but we're in this emergency. Could you bring us up one flight? We just don't want to stay out in the hall here. It's, you know, just too dangerous. At which point the teenage girl looked up, and she was two inches from Paul McCartney. They were face to face. And as she looked at him and realized what was going on, the woman operating the elevator said, I'm sorry, this is a down elevator. We can't go up, and slammed the door in our faces. <laughs> and you could hear that girl screaming all the way to the lobby, like, let him in. Listening to a salute to Music Radio WABC with love from NEWFM. I had a sort of a weird career at ABC. Chuck Leonard. My, my first actual air shift 
was uh, 11 p.m. till midnight, and that grew. I think the next move was 10.30 to midnight, then it became 10 till 1, which was my long-term shift there. That was the shift that most people would remember. I also did weekends. I did Sundays forever. I was the Sunday beach man. <laughs> that was kind of fun. Were you aware of what people were doing, well, without sounding rude, what people were doing when they listened to you? Well, if I'm to believe what the, they tell me today when I meet them in the street, they were growing up to me, <laughs> which is very funny uh, to me because I was growing up to them. How did you get hired at WABC? I got this phone call. I was on the air, substituting for someone else at the time on RL. Uh, and uh, I got this phone call that said, hey. I said, hello. <laughs> yeah, my cousin. Uh, well, at this point, I had been in New York less than a month. And uh, I said, who's this? And he says, Cousin Bruzy? Well, I was the only person in New York who didn't know at the time who Cousin Bruzy <laughs> was. I had already been contacted by a guy called Big Daddy up in Harlem. Uh, some woman with a very unctuous voice called Music Galore out of New Jersey. So I said, well, why not a Cousin Bruzy? Uh, <laughs> so he says, my boss wants to talk to you. Well, they said, not only is there a cousin Brucey, but he's got enough nerve to have a boss. So I said, okay. And then a uh, little we'll silence for a moment, and then, hello, this is Rick Sklar. <laughs> Rick is a gorgeous man. He has a, a sinister sound on the phone once in a while. Okay. I, I got all sorts of images. Of, of the mafia has me. Uh, <laughs> they're going to uh, put me up against the wall to play their records or something. I don't know. So, so can you see me at my office Monday? I said, sure, sure. Man. I'll drop by Monday or Tuesday or whenever. So he gave me an address, which meant nothing to me. And you had no idea these people were from the top radio music go. station in the city? I did not go. <laughs> I just went on about my business. And uh, then... Uh, when I came for my air shift that Monday at RL, which was the evening, I had all sorts of telephone messages, and um, I'd been contacted by the editor of the Amsterdam News. I had been contacted by the uh, ABC uh, UN bureau chief, Mel Good. Uh, I had, oh, let's see, Roy Davis, who was a newsman, I think, at NBC at the time, and they had contacted every... Jeans de Couleur, every person of, of, of the uh, dark persuasion in town to say, would you tell this man that this is something that he should look into? Well, <laughs> I uh, finally went over the next day, and uh, we talked. And, well, negotiations are funny and should be kept uh, uh, in the dark most of the time, but uh, I turned down the job. <laughs> <laughs> they did ask me what was the uh, minimum I would accept, and like that. And I said, well, I gave them some... Figure, which to me I thought was just scandalous. And I went home, went back to work, or whatever, just like it had never happened. Well, uh, maybe a week later I got another phone call, and he said, Mrs. Sklar said, Would you come back and talk to me again? And I did. And, uh, when I came back, uh, I was about five minutes late for the appointment, and I met this gentleman in the hallway who was a photographer. And he says, Are you Mr. Leonard? I said, Yes. He says, uh, Gee, I've been waiting for you. And he took me into what was then their record library. The, the studio wasn't at the new building. It was over in 1926 Broadway at the time. And uh, he says, I've been waiting for you. And I said, what for? To take your publicity shots. I said, oh, oh, I have them now. Really? <laughs> but anyway, it did turn into a, a happy contract and a long, long-running thing. I was there 14 years. Which brings us back to um, knowing what people were doing when they when they were listening to you on the radio. Um, oh, yeah, my Sunday show. I, mm. I had, uh, well, I actually stole a bit from Dan Ingram, who uh, I will always revere as being a very innovative broadcaster. Uh, the rollover bit, which became uh, sort of a, an ABC trademark. We'd have the, the people on the beaches, and if you went to a beach in the New York area, uh, you would hear that chime uh, ringing all over the place. Dun -dun 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 which... Uh, <laughs> We'd have to immediately follow with WABC Chime Time. <laughs> and uh, one of the engineers would uh, throw a yummy across the table. <laughs> 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 a little Pavlovian day, response there. One day, uh, one of my engineers brought in a box of dog yummies, and every time the chime would ring and I'd have to say the time, he'd throw a yummy. <laughs> Pavlov's <great>. dog. <laughs> That's super. What's the, what's the craziest thing you remember that ever happened there? Oh, gee, there were so many... Uh, you know, ABC, WABC, was uh, sort of a celebration of, of, of the, the fun side of New York. In its glory day, uh, it may believe that there were no cloudy days, there was no rain in New York, only light drizzle. Uh, <laughs> so it was always in fun. Uh, and as much as people felt 
that, well, you're very restricted because you were doing a, in quotes, and at that time, uh, still almost a dirty word, top 40 format. We were given a lot more freedom than most other stations that carry the same kind of format. Uh, you found that the, the uh, well, I don't want to call anybody to task, but guys who worked for the Bill Drake formats and like that, uh, they were much more automated, and their responses were much more automatic. Uh, we were allowed to do almost anything we wanted to, all kinds of zaniness, zaniness or whatever, just as long as we didn't become too political or uh, too smutty, because after all, we were a youth-oriented station. What was the happiest thing that happened to you while you were there? Relating to radio. Not Every time I got a raise, it was happy. Yeah, but <laughs> as a matter of fact, uh, Rick Sklar used to have a sign in the studio uh, that I loved. It said, uh, every time the red light goes on, you are very happy because you are making money, which made a lot of sense to me. But uh, I think uh, there was no one incident that was the happiest. I was happy to be working with professionals. Uh, there was a certain stigma attached at street level because ABC was never a hip radio station. It was never one that was avant-garde. Uh, there was always a movement, and the movements varied from uh, underground rock to uh, folk to uh, all kinds of things that happened. And ABC survived all of this. Uh, and even though there was always somebody to detract from what you were doing, we were never really very hip. Uh, everybody knew exactly what they were doing, and it was probably... Uh, take everything else out, all, all other things out of context, taste and everything. It was probably the best overall radio entertainment that this town has seen in a long time. WABC was a business. Once again, Bob Lewis. The guys who worked on it weren't a business. The people who worked on it weren't a business. And the music it played to the people who listened to it weren't a business. You know how serious a movie American Graffiti was, if you stop and think about it. It was a fairly serious movie. There was a movie on HBO not long ago uh, called The Hollywood Nights which was uh, just about a bunch of clowns in the 50s. Uh, it was a far better representation of the 50s than American Graffiti was because it wasn't serious, and the 50s weren't serious. Uh, and the music was fun, what we were doing was fun, but that ra radio station was a business. It was, it was designed to, to skim money off pop culture, okay? And so I don't miss it. I would miss WNEWFM. And I'm not saying that because this is NEWFM. Uh, I'm not saying that WNEWFM isn't a profit making organization. I'm saying that there's a, a, a different approach to its relationship with its listeners. Uh, uh, WABC, because of its large reach, treated its listeners as statistical numbers. NEW doesn't, they talk to people. So I don't miss W.A. I don't miss that kind of radio. I didn't miss it when I stopped. Uh, it was appropriate for its time. D.D. Sharp was appropriate for her time. Okay. But she is not Bruce Springsteen. And uh, uh, she is not Elton John. And uh, neither one of them are the Beatles. Well, the thing that made W.A.B.C. so huge, really, was that, as I mentioned earlier, it was first and foremost a station of its time. Once again, HOA. And I think the time is a very relevant thing in show business, and WABC was show business. And this is the second point that I would like to make. We realized that we were in the broadcasting media, that the broadcasting media demands show business. And we were able to give that type of show business in an industry that was all but ready to lay down and die, because television, the great uh, tube of the picture, was going to claim the whole market, and radio was secondary. And I think it was the indifference, I think that uh, it was the real feeling of, hey, we're going to do something here that no one has ever done before. And it even caught on the engineering department, it caught on the sales department. And all at once we realized that we were onto something that was going to be unique in the broadcasting history. And through this effort and through refinement and through continuous uh, injection of new ideas, new modes, new interpretations, and new fads in, in, in listening, always you knew when you listened to WABC that you, things were going to be pregnant and they weren't going to be a week old. It was going to be right up to date. And through all of these things, we were able to mold this very delicate balance of show business information and, above all, personality. I hope that people like you will keep listening to people like myself and giving me the opportunity to reach other audiences. Once again, Cousin Brucey. I will keep it alive if I have to fight single-handedly, but I know I have a very large army behind me. 
But with guys like you allowing me to talk and be interested in what I have to say, we'll keep it alive. I'm not going to let it die. The music will not die. Well, I think FM in most major cities, in most markets, FM, because of its sound and the better quality of music that you can hear, uh, severely hurt AM. Scott, so. And I think also AM probably stayed too long with too few records of the same thing over and over again, where there was more experimentation, more boldness, more innovativeness, and a better sound for music on FM. So the time that it took for FM to make its move was due to the cost of a person converting their lives, their cars, their homes from an older radio to something they could now hear, music and stereo. Once that happened and people felt and heard the difference, the ball game was over. But uh, there's, it's a very nostalgic thing, and, uh, you know, everything has to end. That's life. Once again, former program director Rick Sklar. So the ABC was like anything else. It's part of life. It couldn't go on forever. But uh, it was a wonderful thing. Uh, it was a one-of-a-kind. I don't think ever be another station quite like that. I mean, the, the scope of the thing was so huge. It was so grand. Everything that was done was on such a massive scale. We gave out buttons. We gave out 14 million buttons. Wear them in, buttons with the WABC call letters, and if we spot you, we'll give you $25,000. You know, where do you uh, come up with ideas like that? 14 million buttons given out. Uh, this, this stuff is it's just not done today. We should save some tapes of WABC the way it was and have a place where when people want to relive their youths, maybe we'll donate something to the Broadcasting Museum where they can come back and listen to a few minutes of Big Dan and the mid-50s and into the 60s and Cousin Brucey and everybody... Uh, it's just one of those things. I, uh, the old WABC's place in radio uh, is being, will be remembered by everyone who ever heard it, who ever grew up. They'll be part of millions and millions, tens of millions of people's lives, and certainly the, the lives of everyone in the radio business. Uh, as we realized this week when this, we had such a tremendous outpouring of sentiment, uh, emotion, and remembrances uh, from just about everybody we know in radio and I just want to thank everyone for all the wonderful things they've had to say uh, it's, it's been a difficult week to go through but uh, uh, everyone's been very supportive about it all so you know now we just have to go on to, to new things and uh, we'll try to recreate a WABC in the sky with the satellites and I think we will and I thank you very much, you know, for doing this. I think it's so wonderful for one radio station to remember another. And a special thanks to Scott Muni. And Eddie WFM would like to thank Rick Sklar, whose ideas created Music Radio 77 WABC. We'd like to thank all those valiant disc jockeys who held down the fort as the end was nearing for Music Radio. We're talking about people that we haven't talked about here tonight. Johnny Donovan, Peter Bush, Mike McKay, Mark Summers and all the disc jockeys over the years that we haven't gotten to. And the ones we did talk with, Herb Oscar Anderson, Chuck Leonard, Babaloo, Bob Lewis, Cousin Brucey, Bruce Morrow, Ron Lundy, and Dan Ingram. And a special note to Dan Ingram. Dan, you're the DJ's DJ. You're the best. It's been a lot of, uh, a lot of records over the turntables to make a very bad uh, <laughs> simile. Uh, there is one thing that I want to say that will be probably the last time that I'm in fact it will be the last time I will ever be able to say this on WABC and the last thing I'm going to say is this is WABC New York I can't say that anymore can I but it's been a ball for almost 21 years for me almost 22 years of this programming that's been on the station all this time and we'd like to play just a couple of things to nail it down Tribute to Music Radio 77 WABC with love and lots of it from Eddie WFM. Production assistance from Robin Sagan and Richard Neer. Invaluable production assistance 
from Stacy Kahn. Produced by Earl Bailey. This is 102.7 WNEWFM in New York. Wow. Wow, that is a tough act to follow. A, a great radio station um, has gone the way, I guess, of a lot of other great things. Two hours is just not enough time to spend talking about uh, the things that they did for all of us in the New York area, growing up in the New York area, and the things that they did for uh, those of us in the New York area who got into radio in the New York area. Um, so I guess on, on, on behalf of, of, of all the people who listened over the years, who, whose lives were just made so much happier, I guess, by, uh, by the people at WNBC, thank you very much. And to uh, those of us in radio who are probably here because of a lot of things that we heard at Music Radio. Thank you even more. Thanks also to Earl, who did an unbelievable job, as per usual. 10 o'clock, I'm Larry Kleinman for Tom Morera at WNEW-FM in New York.